The evidence about ethnic differences can be misused, as many people say to us. Some listeners may feel that this danger places a moral prohibition against examining the evidence for genetic factors in public. We disagree, in part because we see even greater dangers in the current gulf between public pronouncements and private beliefs. The bare answer to the question, are ethnic differences genetic or environmental, has three parts. The first part of the answer is that the environment is unquestionably important. This is proved by a wide variety of data from adoption studies, the life histories of black youths growing up in Georgia, the IQ scores of illegitimate children of German women and black U.S. servicemen following World War II, international comparisons of disadvantaged ethnic groups who are transported to a less punishing environment, and an abundance of other data. But these studies do not prove that the difference is entirely environmental. The second part of the answer is that a serious, legitimate scientific debate is underway regarding the possibility that genes play some role. The evidence is circumstantial. For example, there is no longer any scientific doubt that East Asians have an elevated nonverbal IQ, referring to the kinds of skills that make for good engineers and scientists relative to verbal IQ. This is true of East Asians growing up in widely different cultural and economic circumstances in Japan, China, Hong Kong, and Singapore. It is true of East Asians taking tests developed from scratch in their native languages. It is true of fully assimilated East Asian Americans. It is true of East Asian children adopted at birth and brought up in European homes. It is true of Inuit and American Indians whose distant ancestors crossed the land bridge from Asia. The evidence is circumstantial. But it is very difficult to concoct an explanation for the elevated nonverbal IQ of East Asians that ignores the common genetic heritage of these disparate groups. Another line of evidence pointing toward a genetic factor in cognitive ethnic differences is drawn from the profiles of subtest scores for blacks and whites. It is not just that the overall black mean is lower than the white mean, the profiles differ as well. Specifically, the black-white difference systematically tends to be largest on the tests that are the best measures of what is called G, or the general intelligence factor, and G also tends to be the most heritable element of IQ test scores. Once again, the evidence is circumstantial. But by showing that, in effect, the better the measure of intelligence, the greater the ethnic difference, this pattern undercuts many of the environmental explanations of ethnic differences that rely on the proposition that the apparent black-white difference is the result of bad tests, not good ones. We do not mention these results in an attempt to claim that a genetic component in ethnic IQ differences has been demonstrated. Rather, we want to stress that the ongoing scientific debate is genuine and legitimate. Simplistic assurances that genes cannot possibly be involved are incorrect. This leads us to the third and most important consideration regarding the controversy over genes and environment. The answer has scientific significance, but it shouldn't make any difference in day-to-day -day life. To show why we believe that it makes next to no difference whether genes are part of the reason for the observed differences, a thought experiment may help. Imagine that tomorrow it is discovered that the black-white difference in measured intelligence is entirely genetic in origin. The worst case has come to pass. What difference would this news make in the way that you approach the question of ethnic differences in intelligence? Not someone else, but you. Ask yourself, if it were known that the black-white difference is genetic, would I treat individual blacks differently from the way I would treat them if the differences were environmental? Probably, human nature being what it is, some people would interpret the news as a license for treating all whites as intellectually superior to all blacks. But we hope that putting this possibility down in words makes it obvious how illogical, besides utterly unfounded, such reactions would be. Many blacks would continue to be smarter than many whites. Ethnic differences would continue to be differences in means and distribution. They would continue to be useless for all practical purposes when assessing individuals. If you were an employer looking for intellectual talent, an IQ of 120 is an IQ of 120, whether the face is black or white, let alone whether the mean difference in ethnic groups were genetic or environmental. If you were a teacher looking at a classroom of black and white faces, you would have exactly the same information you have now about the probabilities that they would do well or poorly. More generally, we cannot think of a legitimate argument why any encounter between individual whites and blacks 
need be affected by the knowledge that an aggregate ethnic difference in measured intelligence is genetic instead of environmental. The existence of the difference has many intersections with policy issues. The source of the difference has none that we can think of, at least in the short term. Here's one last question. If the differences are genetic, aren't they harder to change than if they are environmental? This question relies on false assumptions about intelligence. The underlying error is to assume that an environmentally caused deficit is somehow less hardwired, that it has less impact on real capabilities than does a genetically caused deficit. However, if you were to take two handfuls of genetically identical seed corn and plant one handful in Iowa, the other in the Mojave Desert, and then let nature, that is the environment, take its course, you'll make this discovery. The seeds will grow in Iowa, not in the Mojave, and the unalterable result will have nothing to do with genetic differences. It is true that some kinds of environmentally induced conditions can be changed. For example, lack of familiarity with television shows for a person without a television set will probably be reduced by purchasing a television set. But there is no reason to think that intelligence is one of them. Research has shown that an individual's realized intelligence, whether realized through genes or the environment, is not very malleable. Changing cognitive ability through environmental interventions has proved to be extraordinarily difficult. At best, the examples of special programs that have permanently raised cognitive ability are rare. Preschool has borne many of the recent hopes for improving intelligence. However, research has shown that Head Start, the largest program, does not improve cognitive functioning in the long term. Perhaps as time goes on, we will learn so much about the environment or so much about how intelligence develops that effective interventions can be designed. But this is only a hope. The essential point to grasp is this. A short person who could have been taller had he eaten better as a child is nonetheless really short. Corn planted in the Mojave Desert that could have flourished if it had been planted in Iowa wasn't planted in Iowa, and there's no way to rescue it when it reaches maturity. Saying that a difference is caused by the environment says nothing about how real it is. In any case, you are not going to learn tomorrow that all the cognitive differences between races are 100% genetic in origin, because the scientific state of knowledge, unfinished as it is, already gives ample evidence that environment is part of the story. But the evidence eventually may become unequivocal that genes are also part of the story. We are worried that the elite wisdom on this issue, for years almost hysterically in denial about the possibility that genes play a role, could, as a result of new evidence, snap too far in the other direction. We believe that it is possible to face all the facts on ethnic and race differences in intelligence and not run screaming from the room. That is our essential message. Differences in cognitive ability that we have discussed play out in public and private life with profound effects on the demography of intelligence in our society. When people die, they are not replaced one for one by babies who will develop identical IQs. If the new babies grow up to have systematically higher or lower IQs than the people who die, the national distribution of intelligence changes. Mounting evidence indicates that demographic trends are exerting downward pressure on the distribution of cognitive ability in the United States and that the pressures are strong enough to have social consequences. Putting the pieces together, something is happening that is worth worrying about. Improved health, education, and childhood interventions may hide the demographic effects, but that does not reduce their importance. Whatever good things we can accomplish with changes in the environment would be that much more effective if they did not have to fight a demographic headwind. The falling birth rate is a well-known and widely studied feature of this century throughout the industrialized West. What is less well-known but seems to be true among modern Western cultures is that declines in lifetime fertility occur disproportionately among educated women and women of higher social status. We will refer to such women as privileged. Modern societies provide greater opportunities for privileged women to be something other than full-time mothers. Marriage and reproduction are often deferred for education. On the average, such women spend more of their reproductive years in school because they do well in school, or because their families support their schooling, or both. Negative correlations between fertility and educational status are likely to be the result. Even after the school years, 
motherhood imposes greater cost and lost opportunities on a privileged woman than on an unprivileged one in the contemporary West. A child complicates having a career and may make a career impossible. Ironically, even monetary costs work against motherhood among privileged women. By our definition, privileged women have more money than deprived women, but for the privileged woman, a child entails expenses that can strain even a high income. From child care for the infant to the cost of moving when the child gets older to an expensive suburb that has a good school system. In planning for a baby, and privileged women tend to plan their babies carefully, such costs are not considered optional, but what must be spent to raise a child properly. The cost of children is one more reason that privileged women bear few children and postpone the ones that they do bear. Meanwhile, children are likely to impose few opportunity costs on very poor women. A career is not usually seen as a realistic option. And for women near the poverty line in most countries in the contemporary West, a baby is either free or even profitable, depending on the specific terms of the welfare system in her country. Whatever the reasons, and whatever the variations from community to community, the reality in the modern West is that reproductive rates are negatively correlated with income and educational levels, which are themselves correlated with intelligence. People with lower intelligence are out-reproducing people with higher intelligence. Immigration is an even older American tripwire for impassioned debate than differential fertility. Recently, the debate has intensified as the large influx of immigrants in the 1980s, legal and illegal, has reopened all the old arguments. Those who favor open immigration policies point to the adaptability of earlier immigrant populations and their contribution to America's greatness. Anti-immigrationists instead emphasize the concentration within some immigrant groups of people who commit crimes, fail to work, drop out of school, and go on public assistance. As we examine the evidence, we must acknowledge that Latino and black immigrants are, at least in the short run, putting some downward pressure on the distribution of intelligence. Many listeners will find this result counterintuitive. The concept of the high-achieving immigrant is deeply ingrained in Americans' view of our country. But think back to the immigrant at the turn of the century. America was the land of opportunity, but that was all. There were no guarantees, no safety nets. One way or another, an immigrant had to make it on his own. Add to that the wrench of tearing himself and his family away from a place where his people might have lived for centuries, the terrors of having to learn a new language and culture, often the prospect of working at jobs he had never tried before, and the United States had going for it a crackerjack self-selection mechanism for attracting immigrants who were brave, hard-working, imaginative, self-starting, and probably smart. Immigration can still select for those qualities, but it does not have to. Someone who comes here because his cousin offers him a job, a free airplane ticket, and a place to stay is not necessarily self-selected for those qualities. On the contrary, immigrating to America can be for that person a much easier option than staying where he is. The nation is at a fork in the road. It is easy to understand the historical and social reasons why nobody wants to talk about the demography of intelligence. Our purpose is to point out that the stakes are large and that continuing to pretend that there is nothing worth thinking about is as reckless as it is foolish. There is no major domestic issue for which the news we bring is irrelevant. Do we want to persuade poor single teenagers not to have babies? The knowledge that 95% of poor teenage women who have babies are also below average in intelligence should prompt skepticism about strategies that rely on abstract and far-sighted calculations of self-interest. Do we favor job training programs for chronically unemployed men? Any program is going to fail unless it is designed for a target population, half of which has an IQ below 80. Do we wish to reduce income inequality? If so, we need to understand how the market for cognitive ability drives the process. Do we aspire to a world-class educational system for America? Before deciding what is wrong with the current system, we had better think hard about how cognitive ability and education are linked. Let us consider intelligence and educational reform in more detail. Most people think that American public education is in terrible shape, and any number of allegations seem to confirm it. But a search of the data does not reveal that the typical American schoolchild in the past would have done any better on tests of academic skills. 
An American youth with an average IQ is probably better prepared academically now than ever before. The problem with American education is confined mainly to one group of students, the cognitively gifted. Among the most gifted students, SAT scores started falling in the mid-1960s, and the verbal scores have not recovered since. One reason is that disadvantaged students have been in and gifted students out for 30 years. Even in the 1990s, only one-tenth of one percent of all the federal funds spent on elementary and secondary education go to programs for the gifted. Because success was measured in terms of how well the average and below-average children performed, American education was dumbed down. Textbooks were made easier, and requirements for courses, homework, and graduation were relaxed. These measures may have worked, as intended, for the average and below-average students, but they let the gifted get away without ever developing their potential. In thinking about policy, the first step is to realize where we are. In a universal education system, many students will fall short of basic academic competence. The average student has little incentive to work hard in high school. Getting into most colleges is easy, and achievement in high school does not pay off in higher wages or better jobs for those who do not go to college. On a brighter note, realism also leads one to expect that modest improvements in the education of average students will continue, as they have throughout most of the century. In trying to build on this natural improvement, the federal government should support greater flexibility for parents to send their children to schools of their choosing, whether through vouchers, tax credits, or choice within the public schools. Federal scholarships should reward academic performance. Some federal funds, now so exclusively devoted to the disadvantaged, should be reallocated to programs for the gifted. But we urge primarily not a set of new laws. Rather, we urge a change of heart within the ranks of educators. Until the latter half of this century, it was taken for granted that one of the chief purposes of education was to educate the gifted, not because they deserved it through their own merit, but because, for better or worse, the future of society was so dependent on them. It was further understood that this education must aim for more than technical facility. It must be an education that fosters wisdom and virtue through the ideal of the educated man. All that we ask is that educational leaders rededicate themselves to the duty that was once at the heart of their calling, to demand much from those fortunate students to whom much has been given. As we turn the discussion from education to affirmative action, it is important to understand that our society has dedicated itself to coping with a particular sort of inequality by trying to equalize outcomes for various groups. Thereby, the country has retreated from older principles of individual equality before the law and has adopted policies that treat people as members of groups. Our contribution, we hope, is to calibrate the policy choices associated with affirmative action to make the costs and benefits clearer than they usually are. Affirmative action on the university campus needs, at last, to be discussed as it is actually practiced, not as the rhetoric portrays it. Our own efforts to assemble data on a secretive process leads us to conclude that affirmative action as it is currently practiced cannot survive public scrutiny. The edge given to minority applicants to college and graduate school is not a nod in their favor in the case of a close call, but an extremely large advantage that puts black and Latino candidates in a separate admissions competition. On elite campuses, the average black freshman is in the region of the 10th to 15th percentile of the distribution of cognitive ability among white freshmen. Nationwide, the gap seems to be at least that large, perhaps larger. The gap does not diminish in graduate school. If anything, it may be larger yet. In the world of college admissions, Asians are a conspicuously unprotected minority. At the elite schools, they suffer a modest penalty, with the average Asian freshman being at about the 60th percentile of the white cognitive ability distribution. Our data from state universities are too sparse to draw conclusions. In all the available cases, the difference between white and Asian distributions is small, either plus or minus, compared to the large differences separating blacks and Latinos from whites. The edge given to minority candidates could be more easily defended if the competition were between disadvantaged minority youths and privileged white youths. But nearly as large a cognitive difference separates disadvantaged black freshmen from disadvantaged white freshmen. Still more difficult to defend 
blacks from affluent socioeconomic backgrounds are given a substantial edge over disadvantaged whites. There is no question that affirmative action has worked in the sense that it has put more blacks and Latinos on college campuses than would otherwise have been there. But this success must be measured against costs. When students look around them, they see that blacks and Latinos constitute small proportions of the student population, but high proportions of the students doing poorly in school. The psychological consequences of this disparity may be part of the explanation for the increasing racial animosity and the high black dropout rates that have troubled American campuses. In society at large, a college degree does not have the same meaning for a minority graduate and a white one, with consequences that reverberate in the workplace and continue throughout life. It is time to return to the original intentions of affirmative action, to cast a wider net, to give preference to members of disadvantaged groups, whatever their skin color, when qualifications are similar. Such a change would accord more closely with the logic underlying affirmative action, with the needs of today's students of all ethnic groups, and with progress toward a healthy, multiracial society. We have similar concerns regarding affirmative action in the workplace. Employers want to hire the best workers. Employment tests are one of the best and cheapest selection tools at their disposal. But since affirmative action began in the early 1960s, and especially since a landmark decision by the Supreme Court in 1971, employers have been tightly constrained in the use they may make of tests. The most common solution is for employers to use them, but to hire enough protected minorities to protect themselves from prosecution and lawsuits under the job discrimination rules. The rules that constrain employers were developed by Congress and the Supreme Court based on the assumptions that tests of general cognitive ability are not a good way of picking employees, that the best tests are ones that measure specific job skills, that tests are biased against blacks and other minorities, and that all groups have equal distributions of cognitive ability. These assumptions are empirically incorrect. Paradoxically, job hiring and promotion procedures that are truly fair and unbiased will produce the racial disparities that public policy tries to prevent. Have the job discrimination regulations worked? The scholarly consensus is that they had some impact on some kinds of jobs in some settings during the 1960s and into the 1970s, but have not had the decisive impact that is commonly asserted in political rhetoric. It also appears, however, that since the early 1960s, blacks have been overrepresented in white-collar and professional occupations relative to the number of candidates in the IQ range from which these jobs are usually filled, suggesting that the effects of affirmative action policy may be greater than usually thought. The successes of affirmative action have been much more extensively studied than the costs. One of the most understudied areas of this topic is job performance. The scattered data suggests that aggressive affirmative action does produce large racial discrepancies in job performance in a given workplace. It is time that this important area be explored systematically. In coming to grips with policy, a few hard truths have to be accepted. First, there are no good ways to implement current job discrimination law without incurring costs in economic efficiency and fairness to both employers and employees. Second, after controlling for IQ, it is hard to demonstrate that the United States still suffers from a major problem of racial discrimination in occupations and pay. As we did for affirmative action in higher education, we present the case for returning to the original conception of affirmative action. This means scrapping the existing edifice of job discrimination law. We think the benefits to productivity and to fairness of ending the anti-discrimination laws are substantial. But our largest reason for wanting to scrap job discrimination law is our belief that the system of affirmative action in education and the workplace alike is leaking a poison into the American soul. This nation does not have the option of ethnic balkanization. The increasing proportions of ethnic minorities, Latino, East Asian, South Asian, African, East European, make it more imperative, not less, that we return to the melting pot as metaphor and color blindness as the ideal. Individualism is not only America's heritage, it must be its future. In speculating about the impact of cognitive stratification on American life and government, certain tendencies seem strong enough to worry about. To recapitulate, these are an increasingly isolated, 
cognitive elite, a merging of the cognitive elite with the affluent, a deteriorating quality of life for people at the bottom end of the cognitive ability distribution. Unchecked, these trends will lead the U.S. toward something resembling a caste society, with the underclass mired ever more firmly at the bottom and the cognitive elite ever more firmly anchored at the top, restructuring the rules of society so that it becomes harder and harder for them to lose. Among the other casualties of this process would be American civil society as we have known it. Like other apocalyptic visions, this one is pessimistic, perhaps too much so. On the other hand, there is much to be pessimistic about. When a society reaches a certain overall level of affluence, the haves begin to feel sympathy toward, if not guilt about, the condition of the have-nots. Thus dawns the welfare state, the attempt to raise the poor and the needy out of their plight. In what direction does the social welfare system evolve when a coalition of the cognitive elite and the affluent continues to accept the main tenets of the welfare state but is increasingly frightened of and hostile toward the recipients of help? When the coalition is prepared to spend money but has lost faith that remedial social programs work? The most likely consequence, in our view, is that the cognitive elite, with its commanding position, will implement an expanded welfare state for the underclass that also keeps it out from underfoot. Our label for this outcome is the custodial state. Should it come to pass, here is a scenario. Over the next decades, it will become broadly accepted by the cognitive elite that the people we now refer to as the underclass are in that condition through no fault of their own, but because of inherent shortcomings about which little can be done. Politicians and intellectuals alike will become much more open about the role of dysfunctional behavior in the underclass, accepting that addiction, violence, unavailability for work, child abuse, and family disorganization will keep most members of the underclass from fending for themselves. It will be agreed that the underclass cannot be trusted to use cash wisely. Therefore, policy will consist of greater benefits, but these will be primarily in the form of services rather than cash. Furthermore, there will be new restrictions. Specifically, these consequences are plausible. Child care in the inner city will become primarily the responsibility of the state. The homeless will vanish from our public spaces, and perhaps the clinically borderline cases that now constitute a high proportion of the homeless will be required to reside in shelters. Strict policing and custodial responses to crime will become more acceptable and widespread. The underclass will grow, and become even more concentrated spatially than it is today. Perhaps most disturbingly, it is possible that racism will re-emerge in a new and more virulent form. The tension between what the white elite is supposed to think and what it is actually thinking about race will reach something close to a breaking point. This pessimistic prognosis must be contemplated. When the break comes, the result, as so often happens when cognitive dissonance is resolved, will be an overreaction in the other direction. Instead of the candor and realism about race that is so urgently needed, the nation will be faced with racial divisiveness and hostility that is as great, or greater than, America experienced before the Civil Rights Movement. We realize how outlandish it seems to predict that educated and influential Americans who have been so puritanical about racial conversation will openly revert to racism. We would not go so far as to say it is probable, it is, however, more than just possible. If it were to happen, all the scenarios for the custodial state would be more unpleasant, more vicious, than anyone can now imagine. In short, by custodial state we have in mind a high-tech and more lavish version of the Indian Reservation for some substantial minority of the nation's population while the rest of America tries to go about its business. In its less benign forms, the solutions will become more and more totalitarian, benign or otherwise, Going about its business, in the old sense, will not be possible. It is difficult to imagine the United States preserving its heritage of individualism, equal rights before the law, and free people running their own lives once it is accepted that a significant part of the population must be made permanent wards of the state. If we wish to avoid this prospect for the future, we cannot count on the natural course of events to make things come out right. Now is the time to think hard about how a society in which a cognitive elite dominates, and in which below-average cognitive ability is increasingly a handicap, can also be a society that makes good on the fundamental promise of the American tradition, the opportunity for everyone, not just the lucky ones, 
to live a satisfying life. For thousands of years, great political thinkers of East and West tried to harmonize human differences. For Confucius, society was like his conception of a family, extensions of a ruling father and obedient sons, devoted husbands and faithful wives, benign masters and loyal servants. People were defined by their place, whether in the family or the community. So too for the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers. Place was all. All the great religious traditions define a place for everyone, if not on earth, then in heaven. Society was to be ruled by the virtuous and wise few. The everyday business of the community fell to the less worthy multitude with the most menial chores left to the slaves. Neither the Greek Democrats nor the Roman Republicans believed that all men are created equal, nor did the great Hindu thinkers of the Asian subcontinent, where one's work defined one's caste, which in turn circumscribed every other aspect of life. The ancients accepted the basic premise that people differ fundamentally and importantly, and searched for ways in which people could contentedly serve the community, or the monarch, or the tyrant, or the gods, rather than themselves, despite their differences. Philosophers argued about obligations and duties, what they are, and on whom they fall. In our historical era, political philosophers have argued instead about rights. They do so because they are trying to solve a different problem. The great transformation from a search for duties and obligations to a search for rights may be dated to Thomas Hobbes, writing in the mid-1600s about a principle whereby all people, not just the rich and well-born, might have equal rights to liberty. His successor in English political thought, John Locke, conceived of people in a state of nature as being in a state also of equality, and sought to preserve that condition in actual societies through a strictly limited government. What Locke propounded is especially pertinent here because it was his theory that the American founders brought into reality. Locke recognized that there are cognitive differences among people and was strikingly harsh in his judgment about their size, but that does not mean he believed people to have different rights. People are equal in rights, Locke proclaimed, though they be unequal in everything else. Those rights, however, are negative rights. To impose contemporary terminology, they give all human beings the right not to have certain things done to them by the state or by other human beings, not the right to anything except freedom of action. This way of putting it is out of tune with the modern sensibility. Today, the original concept of equal rights is said to be meaningless cant, outmoded. Taking equal rights seriously, it is thought, requires enforcing equal outcomes. The prevailing political attitude is so dismissive toward the older conception of equal rights that it is difficult to think of serious public treatments of it. The founders just didn't think hard enough about that problem, it seems to be assumed. We are asking that you consider the alternative, that the founders were fully aware of how unequal people are, that they did not try to explain away natural inequalities, and that they nonetheless thought the best way for people to live together was under a system of equal rights. The founders wrote frankly about the inequality of men. For Thomas Jefferson, it was obvious that they were especially unequal in virtue and intelligence. The other founders, including Hamilton and Washington, also ruminated about the inequality of men and the political implications of that inequality. In doing so, they were following an ancient tradition. Political philosophers have always begun from the understanding that good policy must be in accordance with what is good for human beings, and that what is good for humans must be based on an understanding of how they are similar and how they differ. The founders saw that making a stable and just government was difficult precisely because men were unequal in every respect except their right to advance their own interests. The task of government was to set unequal persons into a system of laws and procedures that would, as nearly as possible, equalize their rights while allowing their differences to express themselves. The result would not necessarily be serene or quiet, but it would be just, and it might even work. In reminding you of these views of the men who founded America, we are not appealing to their historical eminence, but to their wisdom. We think they were right. The egalitarian ideal of contemporary political theory underestimates the importance of the differences that separate human beings. It fails to come to grips with human variation. It overestimates the ability of political interventions to shape human character and capacities.
people who are free to behave differently from one another in the important affairs of daily life inevitably generate the social and economic inequalities that egalitarianism seeks to suppress. To reduce inequality of condition, the state must impose greater and greater uniformity. In our view, the logic of the egalitarian ideal ultimately leads to tyranny. The same atmosphere prevails on a smaller scale wherever equality comes to serve as the basis for a diffuse moral outlook. Consider the many small tyrannies in America's contemporary universities, where it has become objectionable to say that some people are superior to other people in any way that is relevant to life and society. Nor is this outlook confined to judgments about people. In art, literature, ethics, and cultural norms, differences are not to be judged. Such relativism has become the moral high ground for many modern commentators on life and culture. We think that rights are embedded in our freedom to act, not in the obligations we may impose on others to act. That equality of rights is crucial, while equality of outcome is not. That concepts such as virtue, excellence, beauty, and truth should be reintroduced into moral discourse. We are comfortable with the idea that some things are better than others, not just according to our subjective point of view, but according to enduring standards of merit and inferiority. And at the same time, we reject the thought that we, or anyone else, should have the right to impose those standards. We are enthusiastic about diversity, the rich, unending diversity that free human beings generate as a matter of course, not the imposed diversity of group quotas. As we approach the policy implications of all we have discussed so far, we bring to our recommendations a predisposition. Believing that the original American conceptions of human equality and the pursuit of happiness still offer the wisest guidance for thinking about how to run today's America. Let us return to our original question. How should policy deal with the twin realities that people differ in intelligence for reasons that are not their fault, and that intelligence has a powerful bearing on how well people do in life? The answer turns us back to the ancient concern with place. The broadest goal is a society in which people throughout the functional range of intelligence can find, and feel they have found, a valued place for themselves. For valued place, we offer a pragmatic definition. You occupy a valued place if other people would miss you if you were gone. The fact that you would be missed means that you are valued. To have many different people who would miss you, in many different parts of your life and at many levels of intensity, is a hallmark of a person whose place is well and thoroughly valued. One way of thinking about policy options is to ask whether they aid or obstruct this goal of creating valued places. The great bulk of the American population is amply equipped in their cognitive resources and in other personal characteristics to find valued places in society. We must emphasize that because through much of this program we have focused on people at the two tails of the bell curve. Now is a good time to recall the people in the broad part of the curve between the extremes. The prevalence of the social maladies we reviewed was strikingly concentrated in the bottom IQ deciles. By the time people were even approaching average IQ, the percentages of people who were poor, had babies out of wedlock, provided poor environments for their children, or exhibited any other problem constituted small percentages of the population. Translated into the themes we are about to introduce, the evidence supports the proposition that most people by far have enough intelligence for getting on with the business of life. We believe the policies we advocate will benefit them as well by creating a generally richer and more vital society, but it should be made explicit. Our solutions assume that the average American is an asset, not part of the problem. Nonetheless, millions of Americans have levels of cognitive ability low enough to make their lives statistically much more difficult than life is for most other people. How may policy help or obstruct them as they go about their lives? Our thesis is that it used to be easier for people who are low in ability to find a valued place than it is now. In a simpler America, being comparatively low in the qualities measured by IQ did not necessarily affect the ability to find a valued niche in society. Many such people worked on farms. People who would score 80 or 90 on an IQ test could be competent farm workers, not conspicuously distinguished from most other people in wealth, home, neighborhood, or status in the community. Much the same could be said of a wide variety of skilled and unskilled trades. Inevitably, 
with technological advances, the niches for the less intelligent have shrunk. Out of the myriad things that have changed since the beginning of the century, two overlapping phenomena have most affected people with modest abilities. It has become harder to earn a living to support the valued roles of spouse, parent, and neighbor, but even more importantly, functions have been stripped from one main source of valued place, the neighborhood. Communities are rich and vital places to the extent that they engage their members in the stuff of life, birth, death, raising children, making a living, helping friends, coping with problems, setting examples, welcoming, chastising, celebrating, and negotiating. If there is one theme on which both observers from left and right recently sound very much alike, it is that something vital and important has drained out of American communities. Most adults need something to do with their lives other than going to work, and that something consists of being stitched into a fabric of family and community. The cognitive elite may not detect the declining vitality in the local community. Their lives are centered outside a geographic community. Their professional associates and friends may be scattered over miles of suburbs, or for that matter across the nation and the world. For large segments of American society, however, The geographic neighborhood is the major potential resource for infusing life with much of its meaning. The massive transfer of functions from the locality to the government has stripped neighborhoods of their traditionally shared tasks. Instead, we have neighborhoods that are merely localities, not communities of people tending to their communal affairs. Valued places in a neighborhood are created only to the extent that the people in a neighborhood have valued tasks to do. Thus arises our first general policy prescription. A wide range of social functions should be restored to the neighborhood when possible and otherwise to the municipality. The reason for doing so is not to save money, not even because such services will be provided more humanely and efficiently by neighborhoods, though we believe that generally to be the case, but because this is one of the best ways to multiply the valued places that people can fill. In a decent post-industrial society, Neighborhoods shall not have lost their importance as a source of human satisfactions and as a generator of valued places that all sorts of people can fill. Government policy can do much to foster the vitality of neighborhoods by trying to do less for them. Our second policy prescription proposes a simplification of rules. As of the end of the 20th century, the United States is run by rules that are congenial to people with high IQs and that make life more difficult for everyone else. This is true in the areas of criminal justice, marriage and divorce, welfare and tax policy, business law, among others. It is true of rules that have been intended to help ordinary people, rules that govern schooling, medical practice, the labeling of foods. In looking for examples, the 1040 income tax form is such an easy target that it need only be mentioned to make the point. But the same complications and confusions apply to a single woman with children seeking government assistance or a person who is trying to open a dry-cleaning shop. These systems have been created bit by bit over decades by people who think that complicated, sophisticated operationalizations of fairness, justice, and right and wrong are ethically superior to simple black-and-white versions. Additionally, complex systems are precisely the ones that give the cognitive elite the greatest competitive advantage. Deciphering complexity is one of the things that cognitive ability is most directly good for. Our policy recommendation is to strip away the nonsense. Return to the assumption that in America the government has no business getting in people's way except for the most compelling reasons with compelling required to meet a stiff definition. Simpler rules would also make it easier for people to lead virtuous lives. We start with the supposition that almost everyone is capable of being a morally autonomous human being most of the time and given suitable circumstances. This reflects an old but lately unfashionable truth that human beings in general are capable of deciding between right and wrong. This does not mean, however, that everyone is capable of deciding between right and wrong with the same sophistication and nuances. The difference between people of low cognitive ability and the rest of society may be put in terms of a metaphor. Everyone has a moral compass, but some of those compasses are more susceptible to magnetic storms than others. For example, imagine living in a society where the rules about crime are simple and the consequences are equally simple. Crime consists of a few obviously wrong acts. Assault, rape, murder, robbery, theft, trespass, destruction of another's property, 
fraud. Someone who commits a crime is probably caught and almost certainly punished. The punishment almost certainly hurts, therefore it is meaningful. Punishment follows arrest quickly within a matter of days or weeks. The members of the society subscribe to the underlying codes of conduct with enthusiasm and near unanimity. They teach and enforce them whenever appropriate. Living in such a world, the moral compass shows simple, easily understood directions. North is north, south is south, right is right, wrong is wrong. Now, imagine that all the rules are made more complicated. The number of acts defined as crimes has multiplied so that many things that are crimes are not nearly as obviously wrong as something like robbery or assault. The link between moral transgression and committing crime is made harder to understand. Fewer crimes lead to an arrest. Fewer arrests lead to prosecution. Many times the prosecutions are not for something the accused person did, but for an offense that the defense lawyer and the prosecutor agreed upon. Many times, people who are prosecuted are let off, though everyone, including the accused, acknowledges that the person was guilty. When people are convicted, the consequences have no apparent connection to how much harm they have done. These events are typically spread out over months and sometimes years. The two worlds we have described are not far removed from the contrast between the criminal justice system in the United States as recently as the 1950s and that system as of the 1990s. We are arguing that a person with comparatively low intelligence, whose time horizon is short and ability to balance many competing and complex incentives is low, has much more difficulty following a moral compass in the 1990s than he would have had in the 1950s. Put aside your feelings about whether these changes in the criminal justice system represent progress. Simply consider them as a magnetic storm as a set of changes that make the needle pointing to right and wrong waver erratically if you happen to be looking at the criminal justice system from the perspective of a person who is not especially bright. Our policy prescription is that the criminal justice system should be made simpler. The meaning of criminal offenses used to be clear and objective, and so were the consequences. It is worth trying to make them so again. Of all the uncomfortable topics we have explored, a pair of the most uncomfortable ones are that a society with a higher mean IQ is also likely to be a society with fewer social ills and brighter economic prospects, and that the most efficient way to raise the IQ of a society is for smarter women to have higher birth rates than duller women. Instead, America is going in the opposite direction, and the implication is a future America with more social ills and gloomier economic prospects. These conclusions follow directly from the evidence we have presented, and yet we have so far been silent on what to do about it. We are silent partly because we are as apprehensive as most other people about what might happen when a government decides to social engineer who has babies and who doesn't. We can imagine no recommendation for using the government to manipulate fertility that does not have dangers. But this highlights the problem. The United States already has policies that inadvertently social engineer who has babies, and it is encouraging the wrong women. If the United States did as much to encourage high IQ women to have babies as it now does to encourage low IQ women, it would rightly be described as engaging in aggressive manipulation of fertility. The technically precise description of America's fertility policy is that it subsidizes births among poor women who are also disproportionately at the low end of the intelligence distribution. We urge generally that these policies represented by the extensive network of cash and services for low-income women who have babies, be ended. The government should stop subsidizing births to anyone, rich or poor. The other generic recommendation, as close to harmless as any government program we can imagine, is to make it easy for women to make good on their prior decision not to get pregnant by making available birth control mechanisms that are increasingly flexible, foolproof, inexpensive, and safe. The other demographic factor we discussed earlier was immigration and the evidence that recent waves of immigrants are, on the average, less successful and probably less able than earlier waves. An immigrant population with low cognitive ability will, again on the average, have trouble not only finding good work but have trouble in school, at home, and with the law. We believe that the main purpose of immigration law should be to serve America's interests. It should be among the goals of public policy to shift the flow of immigrants away from those admitted under the nepotistic rules, which broadly encourage the reunification of relatives, and toward those admitted under competency rules, 
already established in immigration law, not to the total exclusion of nepotistic and humanitarian criteria, but a shift. Perhaps our central thought about immigration is that present policy assumes an indifference to the individual characteristics of immigrants that no society can indefinitely maintain without danger. At the beginning of this program, we asked the question, what good can come from understanding the relationship of intelligence to social structure and public policy? We have tried to answer this question in many ways. Our first answer has been implicit. For 30 years, vast changes in American life have been instituted by the federal government to deal with social problems. We have tried to point out what a small segment of the population accounts for such a large proportion of those problems. To the extent that the problems of this small segment are susceptible to social engineering solutions at all, they should be highly targeted. The vast majority of Americans can run their own lives just fine, and policy should, above all, be constructed so that it permits them to do so. Our second answer, also implicit, has been that just about any policy in any area, education, employment, welfare, criminal justice, or the care of children, can profit if its designers ask how the policy accords with the wide variation in cognitive ability. Policies may fail not because they are inherently flawed, but because they do not make allowances for how much people vary. There are hundreds of ways to frame bits and pieces of public policy so that they are based on a realistic appraisal of the responses they will get, not from people who think like Rhodes Scholars, but from people who think in simpler ways. Our third answer has been that group differences in cognitive ability, so desperately denied for so long, can best be handled, can only be handled, by a return to individualism. A person should not be judged as a member of a group, but as an individual. With that cornerstone of the American doctrine once again in place, group differences can take their appropriately insignificant place in affecting American life. But until that cornerstone is once again in place, the anger, the hurt, and the animosities will continue to grow. Once, we as a nation absorbed people of different cultures, abilities, incomes, and temperaments into communities that worked. The nation was good at it precisely because of, not in spite of, the freedom that American individuals and communities enjoyed. Have there been exceptions to that generalization? Yes, predominantly involving race, and the nation rightly moved to rid itself of the enforced discrimination that lay behind those exceptions. Is the generalization nonetheless justified? Overwhelmingly so, in our judgment. Reducing that freedom has enervated our national genius for finding valued places for everyone. The genius will not be revitalized until the freedom is restored. Cognitive partitioning will continue. It cannot be stopped because the forces driving it cannot be stopped. But America can choose to preserve a society in which every citizen has access to the central satisfactions of life. Its people can, through an interweaving of choice and responsibility, create valued places for themselves in their worlds. They can live in communities, urban or rural, where being a good parent, a good neighbor, and a good friend will give their lives meaning and purpose. They can weave the most crucial safety nets together so that their mistakes and misfortunes are mitigated and withstood with a little help from their friends. All of these good things are available now to those who are smart enough or rich enough. If they can exploit the complex rules to their advantage, buy their way out of the social institutions that no longer function, and have access to the rich human interconnections that are growing, not diminishing, for the cognitively fortunate. We are calling upon our listeners to recognize the ways in which public policy has come to deny these good things to those who are not smart enough and rich enough. At the heart of our thought is the quest for human dignity. The central measure of success for this government, as for any other, is to permit people to live lives of dignity, not to give them dignity, for that is not in any government's power, but to make it accessible to all. That is one way of thinking about what the founders had in mind when they proclaimed as a truth self-evident that all men are created equal. That is what we have in mind when we talk about valued places for everyone. Inequality of endowments, including intelligence, is a reality. Trying to pretend that inequality does not really exist has led to disaster. Trying to eradicate inequality with artificially manufactured outcomes has led to disaster. 
It is time for America once again to try living with inequality as life is lived. Understanding that each human being has strengths and weaknesses, qualities we admire and qualities we do not admire, competencies and incompetencies, assets and debits, that the success of each human life is not measured externally but internally, that of all the rewards we can confer on each other, the most precious is a place as a valued fellow citizen.、Mm-hmm.